Thank you. I have some complex ideas to talk about today, and I've made some notes so that I talk about the right ones. Here's the first. We start with a question. It's a question that all of us in this room are going to need to confront. It's a question that everyone that has anything to do with City 2.0 is confronting right now. How shall we live? How shall we live on the earth? You think it's our destiny to be relegated to uh, staying in millions of little boxes scattered around the surface of our land masses, separated by roads and parking lots and cars? I don't think so. Instead, the answer from Kosanti Foundation is this, arcology. Architecture and ecology as two parts of a single whole system to which we as humans belong. This is what I want to talk about, and it's what I want all of us to think about after this afternoon. Kosanti, the name of our foundation, 50 years on, founded back in the 1960s by Paolo Soleri, comes from two Italian words. Cosa, meaning things. Anti, meaning before, before things. It's an urban research foundation before things about ideas, and arcology is one of those ideas. There's a problem with how we have designed cities. In this country particularly, and it's a problem we are exporting worldwide. While it appears to many people that this is a population problem, it is not quite. Rather, it's a problem with pattern. It's a problem with how we're inhabiting the earth, and it's a problem with the pattern of how we have been making our cities. Here's Beijing. Cities appear to be the most recent life form, the newest organism on the planet. The earliest cities are only seven to 10,000 years old. Compare this to the length of time humans have been here, or mammals, or single-celled organisms, or compare it to the time the Earth has been around itself. And it isn't so mysterious, really, that in such a short time, and I'm speaking cosmically here, that we haven't been able really to design cities in a way that is coherent, in a way that is congruent with how the Earth works or with the design of other organisms on the planet. As we've been making cities, suburbs, freeways, farms, factories, cars, pretty much all of our cultural artifacts so far sprawling our thin film of life across the planet's surface in a way which, if all people were to live as we do in America, it would take four more Earths to support us all. We have had no idea how the Earth actually works, how life has worked to establish itself on Earth. As we find out more and more, we've learned that life favors two conditions above all. Miniaturization, and complexity, density in other words, the pattern we aspire to with our ecology. Think for a moment how density works with life. The human brain, a miracle of evolution, dense, compact, complex, three-dimensional, each brain cell synapsed, tightly connected with 15,000 other brain cells. Imagine our brains like most cities and suburbs, only a few cells thick. They'd spread out for hundreds of feet on all sides of our heads. The cost of hats would be prohibitive. The time it'd take for an electrical impulse to get from one side of our brain to the other, the time between, hmm, I'm thirsty, to actually getting a drink, would be too long to have sustained us as a life form on Earth. We are alive today as a species, as the dominant species, it turns out, because of our design, because of miniaturization 
and complexity. So think about what happens to life in the absence of density. When a tree returns its complex miniaturized self to the vast surroundings, we call that decay as death supersedes life. When a football stadium empties out, returning its human particles to the diaspora, it's because of the end, the death of the game. Or when the hyperorganism that is the core of many cities surrenders its makers and dwellers to the dimly alive sprawl of the suburbs, a kind of death comes about because of that too. No, no eco-thinking can ignore density, crowding, the maker of life. Here's one last example from Jeffrey West and the physicists at the Santa Fe Institute. Out there in Santa Fe, they have discovered that an elephant is 10,000 times bigger than a mouse. Makes sense. But an elephant only uses 1,000 times the amount of energy that a mouse does. Why? Because an elephant is not 10,000 separate mice, it is one elegantly designed single organism. And this is the basis of our ecology, the core of the idea we have for reformulating our cities. Elegantly designed hyperorganisms, miniaturized and complex. This is not a reform project. It's not about getting more miles per gallon from the automobiles that are separating us in the first place, but reformulating how we relate in cities to the rest of the living planet. And by doing so in a profoundly dense way, how we can keep it all thriving and alive. We're really at a moment in our culture, the end of one thing, the beginning of another. The end of cheap fossil fuels, the end of a large and wealthy middle class in this country, the end of a stable climate globally, the end of the idea that we are live humans building on a dead planet, and really, the end of architecture and built form that was conceived based on all of the above. With the Kosani Foundation, we're interested in imagining how buildings, how cities perform and how, as a result of a research and knowledge-based living laboratory, Arcosanti, in Arizona, they might adapt and help us to adapt to new cultural and ecological and technological realities. In this moment, the new generation, and if you're here in this room or watching this via streaming video, this is your generation that I'm talking to, your generation is going to be asked to redesign everything. Buildings, landscapes, processes, cities. And we think this must be undertaken in what we call a frugal or a lean way. Here's what I mean. We've begun a project 42 years ago now, Arcosanti in central Arizona, that is an urban laboratory. About 100 people are living and working there today but the intent is ultimately to demonstrate arcology at this place, building a town of 5,000 people on just 15 acres of a 4,000 acre land preserve. We began with a form that performs with sun and seasons and sociability, the apse, a quarter of a sphere facing south. It shades itself from high summer sun and gathers light and heat in the winter from the low winter sun. This particular apse that I'm showing you is a ceramic studio. People work there on a daily basis, but of course, you can't just solve a single problem with a design idea, so this place is also a performance space. There are lectures, chamber music, plays, dance companies have performed here. It's a shelter, really, that connects people with each other and with the landscape. Here's how to connect people with architecture. Just don't build the fourth wall. Open to your surroundings. Part of them, really. This is serious stuff. In order to be part of something, 
There has to be this physical connection. And we're trying to do that with architecture at Arcosanti. Now, this apps form has grown more complex. In this case, integrating work and residential life. We're looking here at a bronze foundry at Arcosanti, sort of built into the side of a cliff. It's opening faces south, and surrounding it are two-story apartments. Here, people live and work in the same place. No need for two separate cities, one where work goes on during the day, the other one occupied at night. And this has become more complex yet. At Arcosanti, here's a picture of a model of an integral urban neighborhood that surrounds a performing arts center. And what do you know, we've actually built it there too. Now, rather than line up houses and institutions next to streets filled with noisy cars and carbon monoxide, we place people in a form in which they can recognize themselves as a community. There are two myths about the origin of architecture. The first myth is one that all Americans who go to architecture school are taught in school. It's the myth where a lone man, and it's always a man too, is wandering in the forest and finds a stand of saplings, and he can bend those sapling trunks down so that their crossed branches can become the roof beams of his little hut the primitive hut, and uh, the sapling trunks can be the columns of uh, this same hut. This um, kind of feeds our cult of self-sufficiency and individualism here in this country. There's another myth, however, and in this myth, a group of people comes upon a natural shallow bowl in the landscape and puts up some boards in the middle and becomes witness to an extraordinary event not the least of which is that this group can see itself as a single entity, a whole community. This is the experience we're after at Arcosanti, the urban effect, the organic interaction of people and things that gives the city meaning and value. And eventually, it's only money, here's a possible three-dimensional form for the entire Arcosanti project, facing south, a truncated apse form for the entire town, solar greenhouses that grow food and produce heat and recycle organic waste and conserve water, miniaturized, complex, three-dimensional, and it's not just about food and energy, it's about materials and buildings and how to move ourselves and our goods and services between them, the city as an information medium. This moment is one in which experiment is called for, the work we are undertaking at Arcosanti is to design, enact what we have designed, learn from enacting, and try again. And that's the purpose of the project. Based on this idea, architecture and ecology, we've developed urban arcology projects for several different climate zones and geophysical locations around the world. Here's one for a trading town in India one for a very cold climate near Cheetah, Siberia, a mining town for about 12,000 people in which the solar greenhouse that ordinarily would feed the town people and recycle organic wastes and also produce heat to power the town becomes huge and uh, reaches right up to the town structure itself. Or how about one on the face of the Glen Canyon Dam on the Colorado River at Page, Arizona? 20,000 people with plenty of water for drinking, for growing fish for food, for recreation, for irrigating the surrounding cropland. And, you know, if you build a hydroelectric dam, it takes about 35 years of operating that dam to just repay the debt in energy that it took to build the thing in the first place. And then what? It's just holding water back? That massive structure? You could do a lot more with that. Another view of an arcology. Dense, three-dimensional, like all the other organisms on the planet. But the work of designing cities is not just to save energy and resources, it is to inspire us. The design of cities is part of a larger scheme of things. Arcology ain't just another fancy label for the view that we should be less wasteful of nature. It implies a fundamental reorientation of our perception. 
What we know of global ecology is that we cannot fix just one thing. Everything is connected. So our demand in this movement is that we think differently about how to live on the earth. Everything is connected and in a profound way that the anthropologist Gregory Bateson explored. In prior, in, <clears throat> yes, I'm talking about Aristotle now. In the prior analytics, Aristotle defines the syllogism as a discourse in which certain things having been supposed, something different from the things supposed results of necessity, because these things are so. There's a major premise, a minor premise, a conclusion, the sort of thing you learned in high school English. In a syllogism, each subject is the object of the next statement, and that's how we have divided up our world so far, into subjects and objects, actors and acted upon, life and not life, man and environment. Here's one. Men die. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates will die. This method of logical thinking has been the basis of Western civilization. It's a way of thinking that has led to science. It's also led to species extinction and to a serious breakdown of the Earth's arcology, ecology. So what if we were to think another way, a way that is proposed by Bateson? How about this? Men die. Grass dies. Men are grass. Yeah, but on a molecular level, on the level of carbon atoms, this is actually the case. It's a case made for connection, not consumption, of people, places, things. So, here's our most recent thinking on connection. The linear city, arterial arcology. It's a habitat that we've designed to respond to the critical situations taking place right now in China and in India soon enough. Here we suppose four things. Food and habitat are necessities. A continent as populated as China on the edge now of hyperconsumerism cannot afford to engulf its farmland with highways, roads, parking lots, dump sites, the consequences of continued suburban and exurban development. Three, a child, anyone really, separated from nature is a deprived persona. And four, and the most important one, there are now seven and a half billion of us on the planet. Linear arcology proposes a continuous urban ribbon, 20 stories high, extending for many kilometers, composed of modules, urban neighborhoods, each measuring around 200 meters in length, accommodating about 3,200 people, along with space for productive, commercial, institutional, cultural, recreational, health facilities. In just a few minutes, a pedestrian can reach most locations in her or his daily routine. A few more minutes, by bicycling, walking, or train, you can reach the adjacent neighborhood, an urban module on the left or right. It's designed to intercept wind patterns in the region, also sensitized to solar radiation by photovoltaics and greenhouses. Here's what it looks like in section. Climate-controlled inner park that becomes a greenhouse in winter under an umbrella in summer. Wind generators, photovoltaics, a continuous greenhouse. Logistical bands for regional and continental trains walkways, water streams, all that, and more. These modular 3D landscapes are like people holding hands, each module kind of a model of resilience and optimism of its habitant, inhabitants, kind of a container for a coherent positivism focused on personal and collective intent, as is the work we're putting on the ground in Arizona right now. Here's what we're talking about. Arcology, architecture and ecology, admitting that we are part of life on Earth, that our culture, built culture especially, can be coherent with nature. And like nature, like all life, our buildings and our cities must be both miniaturized and complex. They must do more than keep out the rain, more than garage a series of segregated activities and people. Let's make our buildings, our cities, grow food, generate energy. Let's design them to recycle waste. Let's make them in a way that allows us to be together face to face and not just back to back. Let's not make them dull. Let's make them support life. 
Let's make them extraordinary in the way they allow us to confront each other and the cosmos. And let's see what happens then.